When it comes to photojournalism and documentary photography, there are moments when you are invited into someone's life. It's the beginning of a special collaboration, when a person or community opens themselves and their lives to you. It's both an honor and a huge responsibility. To be handled right, it has to be more than just making nice looking photographs and padding one's portfolio. Brandon Thibodeau gets that, and you can see that in both his commissioned and personal projects, especially his long-term project documenting the lives of a family in the Mississippi Delta. Despite being an outsider, he and his camera have been welcomed and embraced in a very special way, resulting in images that convey the dignity, pride, and faith of a people that we normally see superficially, if at all. He understands that he may be the author of these photographs, but these are not his stories to tell. It's theirs, and he's just the means by which they can share it with us. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Hey, have you been working through, through, the, through this time? You know, at the beginning of COVID, I panicked. I thought, this is the end of my career. I don't know what's going to happen. And I was I was busier than I had been since moving to Houston, you know, and, and relatively speaking, within a two-month period. And I'd say just within the past two months or so, it trailed off where um, it's dismal. So it, it hasn't been this slow for me since since I started in 04 freelancing. Yeah. So, yeah, this this period of time has been definitely one of reflection of seeing which which way the wheel's going to go from here. Yeah, the some of the people that I've talked to, they seem to be starting to work again. Mm-hmm. But everything is still kind of tentative. Mhm. When you think about all the liabilities, I know like I I had a had a job today and I've got one tomorrow which has been rare in the past couple of months to have them back to back. But, you know, the corporate liability, if you go on assignment with the Wall Street Journal and you haven't already done this, they, they require you to do a, a Zoom meeting with their, their security staff to go over PPE and proper protocol oh, yeah. for caring for yourself and the people you're photographing. And, you know, and there's hazard pays with a lot of publications right now if you have to go indoors or do anything risky. But it seems like it's maybe starting to trickle back in. But there was there was a period where, like I said, we were in Mississippi for two months and at my in-laws. My wife works from home, and we stayed with her her mom out in Mississippi, mainly because I I, I had no reason to be back in Houston. Mm. Yeah, I mowed grass. I was like a farmer, just <laughs> mowing grass, <laughs> doing odd honeydews, keeping productive. Absolutely, it's a devil's workshop were you, were you shooting for yourself much or you were there um a little they reside in another part of the state from where i've, I've photographed traditionally in mississippi mm-hmm. but with this new body of work i've been starting to break the seal on in louisiana they're about an hour or so from that region and yeah. um i took some time to go pedal around there and if nothing else to scout some new locations so, yeah, uh, we're leaving again to go out there Sunday. I'll, I'll do a bit more of that. Uh, w- one of the things I wanted to ask you yesterday, because you're, you're, you're born and bred in Texas, right? Yeah, yeah. But you photographed for, um, for a while in Mississippi, and I've never really lived in the South. I visited there, mm-hmm. and I was kind of curious to hear about how different is the culture between Texas and, and Mississippi? You know, there's a a long-standing debate of whether or not to include Texas in the South, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it really is its own thing. And mm-hmm. even more so now that I think half of California is moving here, <laughs> certainly rising the, uh, rising the rent rates, uh, in Austin, you know, it's, it's odd. I, I remember the New York times that one little anecdote for you, the New York times had this article about language and mm-hmm. the idiosyncrasies of, people's speech and, and terms of the terminology um, based on, on regional identity. Yeah. And funny enough, my area of Southeast Texas, Beaumont, Port Arthur, all the, the words that say, you know, like feeder road for the access road or, you know, or 
I forget what some of them were, but all of mine lined up almost exactly with my wife's region of Mississippi. There might have been a few things off, like we say aunt instead of auntie or something like that. Okay. Or auntie. So I always found that a little, maybe that was meant to be, wish she and I spoke the same language or something. So so when you began the project in, in Mississippi, tell me about coming to sort of understand the difference, the difference in sort of the culture and, you know, because it's kind of like visiting a different country to some degree. It is. You know, gosh, where can I start with that? <clears throat> I grew up, where I grew up uh, is a largely blue-collar industrial worker town. Beaumont, Port Arthur is a major oil refining hub. And, you know, it's like a man's man area. You go hunt with your hunt with your dad, fish with your dad, you shoot guns mm-hmm. and and but yet it was a city it was a 150,000 person town city unlike the region I'd go to in Mississippi which is you know for the most part rural uh, much smaller towns 5,000 you know 500 person town yeah there was I mean it's it's like a world removed uh, world removed from most areas of the U.S. I think most people just feel like they're they're in a completely different universe and what initially drew you to 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 the delta I guess, you know, I've, I've always had a hard time quantifying this, you know, when you make a statement for a project and you try to be concise. And the problem is there are about three or four different reasons I went there, but you try to make a 500 word statement on what you're doing there and three or four reasons doesn't really fit in poetically. Yeah. I had had, you know, a pretty general understanding of the region and an interest. What drew me, I think, the most in terms of time was when I began, it was Obama's you know, first couple of months in office. And so there was a real interest in where, what was Black America, particularly in the South at that time? You know, it raised a lot of questions. So that as an impetus for a specific time you know, as I, I think we, we spoke about in the past, you know, I, my, my background was in economics, uh, rural economics, and realizing after a couple futile years of working in northern Mexico that because of my Spanish was terrible, that I wasn't really building the relationships I'd like to in a, in a body of work, the relationships that are required to, to make such a body of work. I realized that the Delta was precisely the same you know, same place in a way as, 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 you know, any rural agricultural region, uh, anywhere else in the world, there's a reliance upon the land, you know, obviously, but there's a strong reliance upon family and the church, you know, and these support networks. And that drew me, you know, it's always driven me. I grew up in a big Catholic family and particularly having been sick most of my childhood, you know, faith has always played a, a big role in my life. And so things like that really spoke to me. But, and then of course, as, as mentioned, like I was personally in a really rough spot, you know, in, in my own relationship. So getting out and speaking to people and just trying to breathe for once in the midst of a hurricane emotionally was the reason why I said, well, I, it's time for me to go do something photographically it's time to yeah take a break what do you think makes the, that particular area so distinctive because you know in terms of economics in terms of race relations and and the, you know that whole dynamic you, throughout the south you have the impact of you know slavery jim crow economic disparity you have it in you know in Alabama, you have it in Arkansas, you have it in Texas, you have it in Georgia. What do you think is so unique and so distinctive of Mississippi uh, compared to some of those other regions? Because some of the things that you spoke of that, that were the allure for you, mm-hmm. it could be said that you could you could find that in those other regions. Certainly, certainly. I think at surface level that that was the, it's probably the most you know uh, known 
part of the South in a lot of ways. Uh, it's the most storied, you know, it's the fabled blues highway, highway 61 runs through it and, you know, the birth of the birth of the blues, things like that. And then, you know, the middle of your history book is, is filled with chapters upon chapters of, uh, you know, the civil rights struggles. And for me, I think it was, it was a place that was, that I was curious about just because having read so much about it, but why would it be different? I think it's a, uh, I don't know. Gosh, I, it's a hard, it's a hard question off the top of my head to answer. Uh, what makes it so different? Because it isn't really, I mean, it, it is the, you know, one might call it the most Southern place on earth, but I think one of the things that I found it so, so intriguing I found so intriguing about it was this the story that I told you of uh, learning about Mount Bayou and yeah this beacon of of accomplishment that uh, these freedmen and women had achieved in settling their own town you know and a story like that was I think really compelling to me um, and unique that you wouldn't hear from elsewhere. And why don't you share share that here the story of that town. And what role it played in the project? So the body of work in Mississippi was made up of me residing with and photographing a number of families, predominantly one family uh, scattered across the Mississippi Delta. So in quirky little towns like Alligator or Bobo or Duncan, as well as uh, the United States, one of the United States oldest completely African-American communities um, called Mount Bayou, Mississippi. That uh, that town was founded by freedmen, uh, a man, Isaiah T. Montgomery and his cousin, Benjamin Green, in uh, 1887. The, the freedmen were originally from the Jefferson Davis, Joseph Davis plantation, so the very heart of the Confederacy. Isaiah was born uh, born a child slave to, to Joseph Davis's plantation. And when the Confederacy fell, you know, his father and he were able to purchase the Davis plantation for a, a loan of $300,000. And they turned it into the third largest cotton plantation in the state of Mississippi, completely black owned and operated. It didn't, that endeavor didn't last long for a multitude of reasons. There was um, a pestilence, a flood, uh, cotton prices had fallen in, in post-war. Most importantly, Isaiah's father, who served as, as, as the, um, the ringleader of, of these men and women had passed away. So they lost their leadership. And ultimately, due to all these things, they, they, had, they defaulted on their loan. And if you flash forward 10 years later, you discover that Isaiah and his cousin began putting out a call in regional newspapers like in Natchez or, or Vicksburg, looking for the, the diaspora that um, were from that plantation originally. And... What they asked in that ad was for these men and women to take a leap of faith and venture out into what was then the virgin forest of the Mississippi Delta. You know, this this arduous task just laid before them. These were untamed areas with all walks of life and mosquitoes and briars and brush. And but the railroad was coming through, so they uh, were they were buying up their allotments of land, and which ultimately amassed to thousands of acres of land. But I'd found a a New York Times headline in research at the very beginning of all this when I first heard about Mount Bayou, that the New York Times had a headline that said, ex-slaves dream a model Negro community comes true where no white man can own a square foot of property in 1910. And if you read through the subtext of the paper, they paint this picture of Isaiah looking out at his men, carving out the land, and he sees them begin to, to grow tired and weary and questioning. And they quote him as saying, why stagger at the difficulties set before you? Have you not for centuries braved the miasma and hewn down forests at the command of your masters? Can you not this day perform the same heroic duty for yourselves and your children unto successive generations that they might learn to live and worship beneath their own vine and fig tree? So those words to me, took the dreams of enslaved generations and at that moment in time turned them into a reality with black bankers, doctors, and lawyers. In 1910, in the very heart of one of what was, you know, one of the, the harshest places for an African-American family to reside. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and so stories like that that I would come across uh, in my, my past 11 years of being in the Delta are empowering. And they're quite frankly, the stories that I think get swept away in the, the rushed, you know, concise editing of our, of our, our national history books these small achievements or these grand achievements, you know, that there seems to be like a certain timeline of events that, that most children learn in school, but there's all these miraculous events that ordinary men and women, be, you know, began to do extraordinary things that shook lives around them. I just, I found that astonishing, you know, and oh, many people that I, I speak to haven't heard about this. And I just think it's a beautiful tale. I think um, during my time in the Delta, that was, you know, that was one of the, 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 the main draws was exploring this, these untold stories, you know, yeah. told by, I mean, there's been, there's been a few books that did some of the research that I did early on. Uh, there was a, a, an author, she won a, a Robert F. Kennedy uh, book award for her reporting on Mount Viant. I'm trying to think of the name of it at the moment. It's on the shelf. I can't go get it, but um I'll think of it in a bit. You know, one, of the, one of the tragic things about communities like these is that they were often, you know, decimated by the powers that be in those communities. So to, to a great extent, they, they don't exist today, at least in, in the way that they did back then. Um, and I, like you said, it doesn't end up in the written history. But tell me about the stories that you were here when you were hanging around these, these communities and these people making photographs. Tell us about the stories they would tell you about those times. So the, the thing about Mount Bayou is, and I, you know, I, didn't, I, I haven't spent my entirety of time in Mount Bayou, but with the people that I've, I've met over time there, it was, it was funny. And some of them would recall when they were children having a zoo, you know, back in, in that early 1910 article, they described it as being a place where they didn't need a jail because you basically had a community vote if you were gambling or meddling in prostitution or drugs or something. You were just kicked out of town. You know, they didn't have white or black bathrooms. They just had bathrooms at the, at the train station. And it was, it was really, it was a sanctuary. They had a regional hospital uh, the Taboran, uh, the Taboran Knights built a, a, uh, a hospital there that serviced the, the black communities of the region. You know, so, and even to this day, you see what Mount Bayou is today. They suffered in 1940, uh, shortly after World War II or right around World War II. They suffered a, a, a catastrophic fire that destroyed a lot of their downtown. But you still see the infrastructure of a place that was grander than all the smaller towns around it. Large high schools with big rivalries and giant city halls and five, six, seven churches and a big thriving community. Whereas a lot of the smaller communities like Alligator, or Bobo or Duncan and such, their populations are much smaller for one, but they were, they were almost like they were more for specifically for people that worked in the neighboring, in the neighboring farm you know, mm. just outside the outskirts of their village. You know, and I'll, everyone I speak to talks about, a, a, you know, a more, a more bustling day in any of those towns where you had a, a downtown or you had the market and there was people on the streets and a different era for sure. You know, point in case, like one family, the family that I've spent the most time with, the coffee family, uh, there's, they, they are who are responsible for my, being in the Delta, most of them at this point have begun trickling away to Florida. There's better health care. There's more opportunity for jobs. Over a decade, family members have slowly moved there. And now just about the, the last bulk of them are moving to Jacksonville. You know, so that's, that's a pretty good example of, of looking at what opportunities are there. There's organizations that are, that are doing a lot to, to try to keep youth in the region. A lot of people might move to Chicago or St. Louis or elsewhere just for more opportunity. But I remember there was an organization, well, there was a division of the local community college, uh, Cahoma County College, that was doing a, a mentorship program 
for young people in high school where if you were, say, interested in being a dentist when you, you got out of school that day or before you got out of school that day, you could go and sit with the dentist and sort of get a feel for it. Is that really what you want to do? And it was a big effort to try to get people to, to really engage with professions of their future, you know, and, and keep, keep some of that brain drain from leaving. The Candid Frame is largely a listener-supported show, which means that we have largely relied on your contributions to help make each episode possible. Your contributions over the years have allowed us to meet the monthly cost of production, which includes the hosting and distribution of the audio files that find their way to you each week, the creation of our podcast app, which is available to you for free, and investment in the various microphones, recording devices, and software that have improved the audio quality of the show. Your financial support makes it so much easier for us to deliver a show every week. Though we have thousands of people who download each episode, not everyone contributes. But even if just a few hundred more of you did, you would provide us the means to do so much more. So if you've been thinking about it and haven't done it yet, why not make the decision to do it today? You can do that by contributing $5, $10, $20 or more a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash the candid frame. That modest amount makes a huge difference for us. And we could do with your kindness and support. Become a Patreon supporter today. Thank you. So tell me about the the Coffee f- family. Tell us about them and how you came uh, into a relationship with them, and how I, how important was that for the body of work you created? Oh, it was everything. They are nothing short but family. I met the Coffees in a, just a serendipitous way when I first found myself in the Delta in, in the summer uh, two thousand nine. I had been wheeling my bicycle from township to township, and very early one morning on a Saturday, I uh, my very first you know first full day on the ground. I was in Clarksdale, Mississippi, the the largest town north of them. I met a brick mason. There's a photograph I have of a man with a a straw a straw hat, and he's got a bow tie on and a, a dusty work shirt, buttoned at the cuffs, white, and. Um, His name was Marvin Young. He was a brick mason. He had been working to restore the exterior of a of a a building in downtown Clarksdale, and we got to talking about this and that, and where you headed. I don't know where I'm headed. You know, I'm just riding my bike to see what I get into. He said, "Well, let me let me give you one piece of advice." He says, "You know, I want you to remember Ephesians six sixteen. Said you don't know what you're going to run into, where you're going to go, but." Remember, and I'll paraphrase this, I'll always get it a little wrong, but he said that, that that Bible passage says, your faith in the Lord shall extinguish the fiery arrows of the evil one. And, so he's, and then he goes on to tell me that, you know, your faith is a shield and, and don't be weary, don't be afraid, just go where where your heart takes you. And with that, he looked at me and he goes, now I got to eat my ham sandwiches, lunch time. And so... Uh, <laughs> You know, he slaps me on the back and says, go. But Marvin was crying. He was weeping when he was telling me that. Uh, just joyous, joyful as could be in speaking about the Lord. So he, he left me with a smile and a, and a full heart. And the only other pinpoint that I had on the map was a neighboring village called Alligator. And the only reason why it was a pinpoint is because of its quirky name. I pulled up to Alligator, got some chicken from the gas station, sat along a a little creek and ate it and then parked in the middle of town and I'd pull my bicycle out and I'd, I'd just do a, like a, a pinwheel, a spiral, you know, from the middle of town all the way around the outskirts, just zigzagging through every street possible to see who I see. And I met some boys at a, uh, I told you this last night, met some boys in a swimming pool. It was hot as could be. And uh, they said, are you here for the parking lot party? I said, parking lot party they're like yeah it happens up at bruno's gas station right there on on the highway right where you pulled in i said well yeah i'm here for that (laughs) so i knew i had some time a couple hours to burn so i kept riding my bike i found a little church in the back called um 
I'm back in town down a gravel road called the Traveler's Rest Missionary Baptist Church. And I made note of, of uh, when the services were the next day on Sunday. By that time, I ended up figuring I'd go ahead and go up to the parking lot and see what's happening. And when I wheeled up there, there was 20, 30 people all throwing down. You know, there's a man named DJ Super Bean, Mo, spinning records. And people were dancing, did sweaty mess, hot mess. I mean, it was, it was, it was staggering. In the midst of all of that, there was this one man, wiry and rage-filled as could be, twirling like a top, and I, I, his shirt's unbuttoned, his hat's on crooked, one gnarled hand from a combine accident on a farm. And I take one picture, I take one more picture, and on the third one, he cocks his head up and looks at me and I hit that third one and he goes, you better give me some money for that photograph. I said, sir, I ain't got no money. I'm on my bicycle. He said, well, give me your smokes. I said, how about half? He goes, okay. And later on that day, he saw, I was, I was starting to get loose, uh, started drinking a little bit and he, he motions to me to come aside. And I said, uh, man, I ain't coming over there. You, you've been messing with me already. I ain't coming over there. He said, you come here. I said, no, no, no. He said, you sit down. And so I sat down and he goes, you know, look around here. You're the only little white boy with big glasses in this bunch. You don't know a soul. He goes, what the hell are you doing here? Either you got balls the size of your head or you're just fucking <laughs> ignorant. It's like, you're just fucking ignorant. And I said, I, of course, I, I pled the ladder. Right about that time, he looked over his shoulder and uh, there was a young fellow that had been eyeballing me the whole time that I was there. And, and I was always wary that it could be trouble. And James looked up over his shoulder and said, what? And I looked up and there was a boy and he said, go on. He's cool. And the boy went off and I said, James, thank you. Um, I, said, I said, could I like tomorrow? Could I, could I bring you coffee or, uh, you know, uh, we have lunch or something? And his demeanor changed from this wild eyed guy to a curiosity within him. And he said, okay. And um, gave me a general whereabouts of where the house was. We parted ways shortly after that. And so I went to church service at that little church I mentioned that next morning, picked up some things from the grocery store to bring with me, wound up at the house he told me to go to. Well, lo and behold, the house he was staying at, he was, he was basically couch surfing with the coffee family. One of his oldest friends was uh, a man named Mr. Van. He's the grandfather of the family. They, uh, they invited me to stay, and I had bought uh, like freezer pops for the kids, you know, like a big box of 50. We threw them in the freezer. We cracked open a case of beer that I brought. I had some chicken wings that, uh, that were uncooked that we were going to put on the grill, and we just had a, had a time like I'd known them forever. And they asked me if I wanted to come back later in the week. I said, yeah. And that set off a love affair. I mean, to this day, you know, it's, it's so funny. Like even to this day, like last week, literally some of the children that I've, I've known since they were a foot and a half long. Now they're on Instagram, you know, and that's beautiful to me. This idea that I wish you could see my hands, but you know, to, to witness, a child go from a foot to two foot to three foot. And then as their, you know, their cousins are getting older and taller and sassier and they're fighting off boys and chasing girls. And all the while their parents are getting older and the grandparents frailer, you know, it's, it's an honor to, to have been allowed in, into such an intimate space for much, for such a long period of time. What, what does that mean for you as a photographer what does that provide you as opposed to, say, some of the other work that you did? You've done work uh, along the border. Sure. You know, you've done things with communities that are, uh, you know, those fans from the Dallas Cowboys. You know, it's a very different different assignment, very different work that you're doing. But yeah. here you're with, in, in an intimate relationship, not just an observer or a photographer, yeah. And you have an amazing access, but what, what changes for you as a result of that? Everything, everything. I didn't necessarily start off going to the Delta as a photographer, as someone with intent to make this, you know, documentary or book or a series of photographs to do anything with. I went there because I was interested and my heart hurt and I wanted to be somewhere I wasn't. And I had a, a curiosity 
to be able to, the only reason why I've ever been there is because the door was opened and, and it was open to, to a love affair, you know, uh, to a, a, by a family that, that, um, is unshakably generous. And that's something that to be afforded that amount of time, that amount of trust, you know, that amount of approval, it's not something you always get in an assignment, you know? It's like I said earlier, having tried my hand uh, working in Mexico and realizing I I just, my tongue doesn't work speaking a different language. uh, There's a certain bond that, that you have. I mean, for me, photography is about building relationships. You know, I feel like it's a, it's a, it's a medium for making, for building relationships for me, you know, and the photographs are just for, for lack of better term, a byproduct of the experience. It's not something you always get to do with an assignment where you're in and out for three days or, or what have you. The images are beautiful. I really love looking at them. I get a feel not just for the people, but for the place and, you know, the kind of images that I love lingering on. Uh-huh. And Thank you. You, you choosing to do this in black and white on film using a square format and talk to us about the choice to, um, to shoot in that particular way. You know, I came from two camps. One was I, I grew up when I, when I first found photography, uh, I started out in the film dark room shaking canisters and, you know, watching the timer tick and being in a time machine. I lost that for, for several years once I went into newspaper work my sophomore or junior year in college. We made the transfer over from film to digital at the newspaper, and, and then I decided newspaper work was going to be a, a profession, and, you know, there was no turning back. So I, there was about four years, five years, where I wasn't shooting much film. And... At some point, I got a keen interest in it, and the guy that owns the local lab, it's a family lab in Dallas, I told him one day, I said, man, I'm gonna, um, I think I'm going to save up and get a, a Hasselblad. He said, what are you talking? He said, don't blow your money on that thing. He, and he goes, look here, and he pulls out this pristine Mamiya C330, and he said, for a quarter of the price, you could have like a, a glorious camera. And so I got on Craigslist and bought one and I, I toyed around with it with a couple projects and just shooting my buddies around the house. And But it something struck me that, you know, it was suddenly a different format. I, I found myself shooting differently and I wanted to apply that to something with real intent. And the black and white just brought me back to full circle to where I began, you know, in, early on in the dark room, you know, and when you get into that, you get into this. You know, it's no longer this idea of talking about with my buddies that are that are freelancing, like, what client do you have? Or, you know, how was that editor? Or what was the project you were on? Now it's about process. You know, it's about it's about materials. The language has changed. You know, there's a preciousness to the things we talk about. And mm-hmm. it's thoughtful and, and, and revered. It's it shifted my entire workflow. And with the black and white work, you know, there's. I, I don't know that it was a, like a, a very conscious decision to say I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a bunch of black and white film and do something, but I, I can tell you that that's about all the film I had in the box to go with me on a trip. So that's what that's what I shot. I think I had looking back. I was digging through my archive the other day. I have. I actually have like three or four rolls of color film from the Delta on that first trip, from the parking lot party actually. And, and it's funny, the, uh, the colors and how different the two worlds are when comparing the black and white film from, from that same day, that same hour to the color. But I think, you know, there's a way with black and white for me, I think it, it allows you that, to rid yourself of a sometimes unnecessary layer of information. I can, it's almost as if you can, you know, help guide the viewer or... or keep the viewer in a frame of mind in a way it's easier for me in some ways when I think about it to create a world with black and white Mm -hmm. than it might be with color that suddenly gets into realism and literal, you know, like literal, literal images. I don't, yeah, I don't know, but Yeah. yeah. Because of the dynamic that you had with the family, it wasn't, it was all self-assigned. 
So this is just something you were doing on your own. And yeah. as a result of you having this relationship, uh, I'd love for you to talk about the sort of responsibility you felt towards them, um, not just as subjects, but as people that you had come to, to know and, and consider friends, especially considering that you're on, you're an outsider. Sure. Gosh, where do I begin with that? Who I am, what I look like, where I come from was never lost on me. You know, there's a, there's a weight that comes with being a white photographer and a, a, a space of color. And I think it was, you know, there's, there's a duty to understand the history of that, the ramifications of that, and the preciousness of what you're doing, the vulnerabilities, and not falling into stereo, stereotypes or framing people from your own perspective. It was something I considered from day one. And, you know, of course, when you're photo, when you're, when you're meeting people, I'm a firm believer that you don't, you know, you make a friend not by exposing your differences, but and sharing your similarities. And for me, I think you can only really understand someone as, as much as they're willing to allow you to understand them. I don't, I don't believe that I could ever truly experience the world as someone else short of climbing in their skin and, and, and living in their dreams, you know? So I have to rely on what, on what others tell me and try to translate that photographically. And part of that is, is by being there, by being, by being as much of the place as anyone else in the room. And a big part of this project was based on transparency transparency of what you know what the images were and the fact was for the for the first couple years there there was no intent with the photographs they I, I cared for the people they cared for me I kept coming back and all the while there were pictures being being taken one point to that is that when a couple years prior to my meeting the coffees I was told that the, Mr. Van, his home had burned down. So the family home had burned down. He basically, he lost everything. He, he managed to run out with his guns and his, and his coin collection. And that was it. There were, there were no family albums. There was nothing of that sort saved. So I, I asked Mr. Van that once, you know, of, of what it means for me to be, be here, to be in this place, to photograph. And he said, your photographs bring us joy. He said, they bring, they bring me joy. They bring us joy. You know, so over the years, as I said earlier, and, and seeing this timeline of, of, of growth, you know, it's, it's contributing to, you know, a rebuilding of a family album in a way. And, and that's, I mean, that's an absolute honor in itself. I don't know. A lot of people go into this idea of, Believing, I mean, I, I, I believe that f photographs, you know, can change things, you know, that they, they do things for the good in photojournalism and, and such and raise awareness. But it wasn't like I set out to make this body of work to change anything. It, it wasn't necessarily set out to, to, with an agenda of social change. It was more, if anything, it... Um, you know, it, it, if, if it can do nothing else, it, it just, it sheds the light on, on a certain people and, and, and shares certain attributes that are empowering and uplifting, sweet and tender. That in, in a lot of ways, you know, like I say in the book, in reference to the Martin Luther King quote from his sermon, um, you know, that idea of faith and perseverance, that's something that's common to us all in the matter where we come from, what we look like. I think those universal, those universal traits are, are more and more obvious the more you're willing to open your eyes and look. And, and that's what we were talking about the other night, this idea of empathy. Empathy is, is something we all strive to have and, and work pretty hard to keep, and it's, it's not easy. Anyway, I'd, I'd mentioned last night that Cornell West quote about um, 
uh, empathy is not simply a matter of trying to imagine what others are going through, but having the courage to do something about it in a way empathy is predicated upon hope. And I, I thought that was just so special. It's powerful. I, I'd like for you to tell me how you know, this project, the relationships you developed with the coffees, especially over this long period of time, how, how has all this changed you? You know, for one, just, you know, the obvious with my time in the Delta while, while photographing there and living there, I mean, a lot of it has, has pushed me to be photographically speaking, a, a better human photographer and knowing um, who I'm, who I'm with and, and what their history is. And, and, you know, like in this, I've read so much about black history, particular to that region, learning the history of, of photography and relationship to, to black America, you know, it forced me to build context around the images I was making in hopes of avoiding the stereotypes and pitfalls and downright racist representations that white practitioners have as exacted on those communities throughout photo history. You know, so it, it pushed me to be not only a, a, a a better photographer, but a, a better, caring, understanding human being. And then the other, on the personal side, it taught me so much more about the true value of faith and how, how that can support you and stabilize you in your life. To this day, um, we'll get, I'll get a Facebook message in, in the middle of an afternoon on a Tuesday reminding me to say my prayers or we're praying for you or here's a Bible verse, you know, we wanted to share with you. You know, it's, it's also reinforced my, my own walk in religion. It just pushed me to love, you know, push me to love more. Well, my last question that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend another photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? You know, I have one of my best buds in the world is a guy named Gareth Phillips. He's a Welshman, and he is one of the most magnificent and driven narrative builders that I know. Creative is all get out. It's constantly making books. And... You know, for, ex for example, uh, just it was a couple of years ago, he got a grant to walk the entire the entire coast of Wales to depict what he found there, uh, the life and the landscape. He's always on these you know, sort of Carlos Castaneda mystical journey of finding the spirit of a place. He's a magnificent, good hearted, positive person that continuously inspires me every day. Well, Brandon, thank you for that suggestion. And thank you again for your time. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. You as well. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real treat. Thank you. Thanks to Brandon for joining us. Find out more about him and his work by visiting brandonthibodeau.com. And if you're a devoted listener and subscribe to the show, write us a review on whatever service you listen to podcasts. Those reviews have allowed us to grow. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and our mailing list. On the YouTube channel, I offer critiques on images submitted by TCF listeners like you, while the mailing list keeps you updated with all TCF events, including workshops and more. Sign up today. And remember, you can support the show by contributing to our Patreon effort or make a one-time or reoccurring donation via PayPal. Thanks to Sanjay Vijanathan for his recent contribution. We also provide a series of ebooks on photography available for purchase on our website. It's my way of sharing my experience and knowledge and another way for you to support the show. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you listen to podcasts, download the Candid Frame app, which is available for both Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at theothermartintaylor.com. 
show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty-free music can be found at Incompetech.com. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. <laughs>